We're going to get right into our Christmas message. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. I want to read a very familiar story. It's just not Christmas unless you read a little bit of the Christmas story. It just makes it feel that much more uh, uh, just, yeah, it's sentimental and just reminder of what we are celebrating here this morning. So in Luke chapter 2, I want to read the, just some verses from verse 8 to 11, because today I want to share with you a simple message called today, A Savior is Born. So in Luke's gospel, Luke writes this, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Well, let's open up in a word in prayer. Father, we're so grateful for Christmas this morning. And Lord, as I share your word, as we celebrate the, the birth of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, Father, I pray that you just help me, anoint me, be with me, be with my mouth, help me to communicate this incredible message in a spirit of faith and, and in, in the way that it needs to be done. And God, I pray for open hearts. Let every heart be open to receive what you have to say to us. And so God, we're thankful for all that you've done for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I want to focus in on this, this verse, which was the last verse. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who's Christ the Lord. You know, that's a powerful word, the word saved, you know. And a lot of times, you know, you might hear that in a derogatory way. Oh, he got saved. But what does that word saved actually mean? I remember when uh, I grew up in Cranbrook, B.C., and uh, I went into one of the washrooms one time, and someone had written on the wall, Jesus saves. Now, this goes back into the 1980s, and somebody in a different colored pen writes underneath, but Gretzky gets the rebound and scores. Uh, what a, back, th those were the good old days when the Oilers had something to cheer about. That's for you, Neil. And I uh, just thought you'd appreciate that. And so, you know, uh, you know, but what does that word saved mean? Does it mean they got religion? Does it mean that uh, they're trying harder or they made a New Year's rev resolution? What does that word saved actually mean? And so we're going to unpack that because I want to talk to you about three-dimensional salvation today in three different forms. We're going to unpack that word because the word saved means, it means more than forgiveness of sins. However, if that's, if that's all it meant, that you're forgiven of your sins, I mean, it would be, an, it would be a fantastic word, but the scriptures reveal it means more than simply having your past canceled out. It speaks of being set free, liberated, made whole, you know, delivered, healed. It's an incredible word that is summed up in that little five-letter word, say. And so we're going to unpack that today. We're going to talk about salvation in three dimensions because, uh, well, Jesus saved us from something, and you are saved for something, and you're saved by something. And why this thing is so, why, notice that, that God sent his son to be a savior because that's our greatest need, isn't it? You know what? It, our greatest need was not education because then he would have sent to just a teacher. Uh, our greatest need wasn't a, just to be influenced because then he would have sent a TikToker. Our greatest need, you know, was not just for, uh, you know, some motivation or else he would have sent a life coach. Thank God he didn't send a life coach or a TikTok influencer. If you don't say amen, you can say ouch, but we just know that. All right, you know, but what does he say? He sends a savior. Why? Because all of us needed to be saved from something. What is it that we need to be saved from? Well, I'll tell you what, that's my first point. We need to be saved from our sin. What does it mean to be saved? I told you that one already. Saved from my notes. All right, Jesus, he saved us from sin because isn't that our biggest problem? Your biggest problem and my biggest problem is sin. Now, I grew up where we, we you know, kind of listed the sins. We had the really bad ones, which we called mortal sins, deathly sins. Then we had the lighter ones, like if you eat a steak on a Friday, well, that's venile sin. So we grew up in this category of sins. But what exactly is sin? Sin is more than simply a list. You know what, you know what, that sin, you know what sin really is? is? Is the fact that it's an attitude that I don't need God. 
that I know better than God. Isn't that what, what, how the, the serpent deceived Eve? Said, if, you know, God knows that if you eat of this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be just like him. Like, what a lie, because they were already made in his image. And it was somehow Satan introducing this doubt that God is holding out and that you could become godly without God. You could live your own life without God. You know, you take the word sin, what's in the very middle? It's the vowel I. You take the five-letter word pride, what's in the very middle? You know, it's the word I. I tell you what, I need to be saved from, first of all, is myself. And uh, that was kind of too hard of an amen from that area over here. You know, <laughs> amen, Pastor Anthony, we've been trying to tell you that. You're your biggest problem, I know. See, heaven is a, a perfect place, and you got to be perfect to get there. And none of us are perfect. None of us measure up. The Bible makes it very clear. There's none righteous, no, not one. Nobody has ever lived a perfect life. And so uh, that's why I love the fact that, you know, when the angel appeared to Joseph, who at that time was thinking of divorcing Mary because her story seemed so unbelievable that an angel appeared to her. Now she's pregnant with the Son of God. Yeah, right. You know, I'm sure Joseph is thinking, what happened to her? What got into her? I tell you, when you encounter Jesus and when Christ comes to live on the inside of you, the people around you are going to start wondering too, what did they get? What's this save stuff all about? It's about having a personal relationship with God through his son Jesus. But the angel said this, give him the name Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. I tell you what I need. I I love that. Again, God is making it clear. He's sending his son as a savior. The name Jesus means to save. And so God sent Jesus to save Anthony from his sins. I tell you, I'm my biggest, my own biggest problem is me. And you're probably your own biggest problem. Some of us, we don't even need a devil because we do a good enough job messing up our own lives. You know, nobody, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hmm, I think I'm going to destroy my life by addiction, adultery, and abusiveness, and, do all, and cheating, and lying. No, n- nobody ever does that. And if you did, you really need to come to the front for prayer at the end of the service. But why do we sin? Because we somehow think that we're going to solve our problems. That's exactly what I need. I need that need met, so I'm going to do it like this. And what happens, it always, doesn't it always seem to have a horrible consequence? But yet we're still convinced that we know best. God, I, I know you gave me this life, but listen, I'm going to live life on my own terms, in my own way, because I know better than you. So sin is really to live outside of that, that relationship, no longer living on dependence upon God. And so we get this as Blaise Pascal, the French physicist, said he talked about the God-shaped void because every one of us were created not for religion, not for the rules and the regulations and the rituals. We're made for a relationship with God. And when you are connected with God and walking with God and walking in His love and His peace, you're at your best. But when we don't have that, when we're disconnected because I'm going my way. Each one of us has, you know, gone his own way. God, I don't need you in my life. You're for religious people. I'm a real person. Thank you very much. I'm going to do my own thing. God, I'm not interested. Leave me alone. You do your thing, spinning galaxies and whatever. I'm doing my thing. And that's, that's called pride. That's called sin. And so out of that emptiness, so we get this emptiness, and then we try to fill that emptiness with everything this world has to offer. You can try pills, you can try a bottle, you can try programs or self-actualization or, or self-awareness or, you know, religion or, uh, you know, debauchery. We try all of these things because something is missing. We try to fill this God-shaped void, but we come up empty. Why is that? Have you ever noticed, you know, People try all these things, and they're just, nah, nah, it doesn't, doesn't scratch the itch. There's something more. Because that should be, logically, you should follow that thinking and realize, obviously, that I'm created for more than what this world has to offer. Yes, you are created more for things. You are created for a relationship with God. You are a person of destiny and a person of purpose. And that's the first thing you need to, to recognize is that God loves you. He's got a plan for you. And salvation means that God saves you from your own devices, saves you from your sin, from shame, from guilt, because I needed a Savior because I'm not perfect. So I call on Jesus and he did a, a miracle in my life. Come on. If he did it for you, you can thank him and praise him too. So that's the first thing. 
Because, you know, we think that sin is going to solve our problem, so we do things in our own way, and then it blows up in our face. And, and let me tell you, every problem in your life and my life, every, pro- every, every problem comes down to this thing called sin. That bitterness, right, hatred, anger, resentment, shame, a lot of mental, you know, challenges can be traced right back down to this thing that you're living things, doing your own way, making, you know, reap, and you're reaping what you're sowing. And so if sin is our greatest problem, thank God Jesus came to save us from our sin. And I I, I love this verse in Romans. In the Message Bible, it says, I've tried everything and nothing helps. Hmm. I'm at the end of my rope. You feel like that way? Some of you, relatives are coming, pressure is on, financials, you know, crunch. Maybe you don't have job certainty. You're at the end of your rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? I like this. Religion left you dry and used and hurt and abused. Isn't that the real question? The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. Come on, somebody. Can you thank God for what he's done for you at the cross? Christ, the innocent, went, he went to the cross and took our place of penalty, took my sin, my shame, my guilt was upon him so that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the first point is this, is that Jesus came to save us from something, and that something is called sin. And so we need, first of all, to be saved from our past. And isn't that good news that you don't have to carry your past into 2024? You can have all that the Lord has in store in 2024 because it's really spiritual if it rhymes. Yes. You, you, you might have been, had a poisoned past, but it, it doesn't need to affect your future. You can have a clean slate. You can experience peace with God. You can have forgiveness of sins. You can get a fresh start, not because of you, but because of Jesus. All right, that's the first point. I like the second point too, is that you're not only saved from something, you're saved for something. Man, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. In, in North America, evangelical, Western, you know, uh, branch of Christianity, it's like the emphasis, and it really bugs me. I'm going to be really honest with you. It really bugs me when I hear that our message is about get out of hell, you know, free card. How many preachers talk about hell? Like, that's the ultimate. You know, you better get saved or you're going to hell. And so when you, now, just, I want you to consider something. What if that's not the main message? So when you read the book of Acts, and I challenge you to do this, check this out in your Bible, see if I'm telling you the truth. Does Peter in the the apostle in the book of Acts, does he mention hell? No. Does Philip mention hell? No. Stephen, no. Stephen preached for a whole chapter, and they finally stoned him. He doesn't mention hell. Paul writes two-thirds of the New Testament. In all of his preaching, he doesn't mention hell. Now, are you saying, Pastor Aaron, there's no such thing as hell? No, of course I'm not saying that. Don't read what I'm not saying. You know, it, the Bible talks about it, but the message is not about fire insurance. If that's all that our message is about, is so that one day you die, you go to heaven, then you miss the boat, and you miss the helicopter, and you miss the elevator. You miss them all. That's not the message. Oh, there's an elevator? Yeah. Anyway, I just said that for emphasis. So when I think about this, we're not just saved from something. There's so much more because you're saved for something. Oh, listen, look at, look at this. Oh, I love this verse. The Bible speaks, of, Paul writes this. He says, who saved us. And, and that's where all people read. I'm just saved. I'm just going to hang on until we get through because the end is near. Modern day prophecy is being fulfilled in the Middle East. Jesus is probably going to come back. I just want to get saved. Just want to get out of here. No, no, my friend, there's so much more. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling. What what, what are you saying, Pastor Anthony? I'm saying that not only did Jesus forgive you of your sins, but he's got a calling on your life. What? I have to become a pastor or a priest? No. Why do we always think that if you have a calling, that then you are in uh, the ministry? Listen, my friend, you've got a calling and you are in the ministry. You are just as anointed as I am. You are just as called as I am. God's got a purpose for your life. It just may not be here. My calling takes place primarily in the realm of the church, but uh, that makes, listen, and your calling 
primarily is going to take place outside the realm of the church. You are just as called and anointed as Christ's ambassador on the street that you live, the school that you attend. Come on, the workplace, wherever you live, you got a calling to be Christ's representative. You might be the only epistle written with the, with the Spirit of God that somebody, you might be the only Bible that somebody's ever going to read. I want you to know, my friend, that God doesn't call perfect people. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Who saved us and called you with a holy calling. What? Listen, there are people that have a calling just to make money hand over fist. That's an awesome calling that I envy. <laughs> Think about, like, I watched that video about City Serve, what we were able to do. Did you know that since, since June, we've given away over $5 million worth of goods to families and organizations in name? How awesome is that? You know, but to do that, we rent trucks, we hire staff, we have a warehouse, we got to pay that monthly. It costs us a lot of money. But thank God for people that recognize that their gifting is not only to make money out in the, you know, in the, in the world out there, but they're an example. They're leaders. They got influence. Come on, they're using their God-given gifts and talents to see the kingdom advance. They're inviting people and bringing them to church. My friend, you are called, you are anointed and set apart. For You're saved from something, but you're saved to something, to a life of purpose. Oh, I like this. Who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. Whew. In other words, you weren't good enough to qualify yourself. And you're not bad enough to disqualify yourself. God, he, he, he knew your works, but he didn't call you according to your ability. He didn't call you because of your abilities. He called you because of his grace. And God is not depending on what you can make out of yourself. God, listen, you know, God is, that would be an impossibility. God is depending on what he can make out of your life. So when you surrender your life and say, Jesus, I'm all in, I'm yours, God says, great, let's go to work and let's light up the darkness. Let's do something amazing out of your life. Isn't that good news? That's a good place to thank God. Unless you're perfect and then you feel disqualified. All right. But according to his own purpose. Ooh. I like that. God's purpose. He's got a purpose for you. He's got a purpose. You're, you're not an accident. You're not a mistake. You're not a screw up. You're not forgotten. You're not rejected. You are God's idea. And he called you. He's got a purpose for your life. Oh, I, I'm glad that I'm saved out of my shame, out of my addictions. I'm, I'm glad that the past is past. But I'm also, what thrills my heart, what captures my imagination, what, what, what causes that adventure gene to resonate on the inside of me is when I think about what he's called me to. I'm called out of darkness into light. I'm called out of bondage into freedom. I'm called out of death into a life. I'm called out of just ordinary vain living into a life that's marked with purpose and opportunity. And so are you. Can I hear a good amen? I, 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 I like this verse. This is about the children of Israel coming out of slavery in Egypt. Then he brought us out from there that he might bring us in to give us the land which the, he swore to our fathers. I, I like that. Too many Christians are just, you know, some of you, you know, you're here for the Christmas service. You're, you, you're, you attend church very regularly. Every Christmas and Easter, you're here. Every, I, I could count on it. It's like, it's like because we think, that oh, I just need to make sure that things are good with me and the big guy up there if something were to happen. My friend, I just, that's like, that's like my relatives when they came over off the boat. My, my family came off the boat and they landed at Pier 18 up in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And uh, when they, and I remember one of my relatives, you know, they, they were very poor in Southern Italy. In Calabria, after the war, they had very little money. And so they, my, I, we still have these big trunks that they loaded with tarali. Some of you Calabresi, you know tarali, or in my dialect, taradre. You know, we, you know we, the, in my dialect, we take the double L's and make them dr. So it's not mozzarella. We say mozzarella. You know, it's just one of us. So then you know these are Calabresi, which is a good indication. You should know that. Because if they're Calabresi, Stati attendo, stati attendo, be careful. All right, <laughs> laugh at my jokes, nobody gets hurt. Okay, so, uh, so my, one, of my, one of my cousins, Luigi, he loaded up 
And every day when people were going upstairs to eat the big buffets, you know, and, and uh, he'd go downstairs and open up his trunk and eat some tarali and maybe some suprasat, a little bit of, you know, cheese. And he did that for the whole 18-day voyage. And then when he arrived, you know, in Halifax, you know, Aunt Rosa saw him and Rosa, ah, hey, Luigi, you know, come on, I'm going to, come on, you know, let, what do you want to do? Welcome to Canada because I want to eat. I've been starving on the boat. And she says, why do you mean you've been starving on the boat? They feed you breakfast and lunch and dinner. Oh, no, I, br I just brought my my case with Tarali, and I, every month, I couldn't afford it. I didn't have any more money. And they said, well, don't you know when you bought the ticket that the meals was included? He didn't know. And so many people, they, they're settling just for fire insurance. I hope one day I make heaven. But you're missing out on the joy of living every day with purpose and excitement and walking with God and experiencing and enjoying His blessing. Let me ask you a question. How many of you own a cell phone? Okay, good. How many of you own a car? How many of you live in a house? All right. Well, congratulations. You are part of the 3% of the richest people in the world. Did you know you're part of the, the 3%? Yes, part of the 3%. Did you know that 50% of people live on less than $2 a day? Half our world is living in survival mode. Half our world. Yeah, very, we, 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 we live in a blessed country. Come on, can it be better? Absolutely. But I'm thankful to be in Canada. A amen. And, and, I, and I thought about that. A lot of people, they, they settle for survival, or that's all they got. They're living in survival. And sometimes our faith looks like that. Well, I just want to be saved. I just want to make heaven. And so you're living in, in, in survival mode. And then to go up one step, and that's how the children of Israel were, right? They were under slavery. They just were trying to hang on. But God set them free, and they spoiled the Egyptians, and then started to live, and they had prosperity, and they were living even though they were in the desert. They had food every day. They had an abundance, and they had, they had gold, and they were giving, and they were generous. They had success. But how many know success is the, your greatest enemy? Because it keeps you from the third level, which is the ultimate level, and it's called significance. And so, so many people settle for a level of success, and they just shut right off, and they think that's all it is. I got a house. I got my car. I got my cell phone. I got my Netflix, and I, and I, I got everything I need. My friend, there's so much more, because the highest calling is to live a life of significance. And what is significance? And significance is not that you become an influencer on TikTok, or you have so many followers. Significance means you add value to somebody else's life. My friend, we're called to make a difference in somebody else's life by your words, your generosity, your actions, your kindness. Come on, spreading the love. You can add value. There's nothing higher than discovering your purpose and living a life of significance by adding value to somebody else. Come on, somebody. If you believe it, give God a shout. My third point. Only nine more to go for the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, we are saved. We're saved from something. Saved from a past. Saved from sin, from shame, guilt, and fear. Thank God. But I'm saved for something. I got a, I got a, I got a future. God's got a purpose for me, for you too. And it's a, you're called according to His purpose and grace. Why? Because He knows that we need a lot of it. <laughs> okay, I'm speaking for myself. Some of you, not so much. Uh, but then the third thing is we're saved by grace. Look at this verse. I think you know the verse I'm going to bring up. It's found in Ephesians. And Paul says, for by grace... You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You know, this thing is not of yourselves. What's he talking about? He's talking about our salvation. In other words, you can't save yourself. If you can save yourself, if somehow you had an ability to, you know, do things right, do it the proper way, do the right ritual, pray the right prayer, do all these things right to make heaven, then God never would have sent Jesus. What you're saying is, Jesus, you're redundant. You're un unnecessary. It was irrelevant that you came to earth because I can save myself. Listen, you cannot save yourself because our issue is not morality. Our issue is that we're dead spiritually. Right? The wages of sin is death. There's none righteous, no, not one. Every one of us is, is sin. And so what, what, what is, you know, think about when my, when my spirit leaves my body, that's called physical death. It's separation. Death is a separation. And so, what was, so the gospel, you've heard me say this, the gospel is not about trying to make people, bad people, moral. It's not about, you know, you need to behave better. It's not behavior modification. It's not about telling bad people you need to behave and be good now. Listen, your problem is much deeper than that. Your problem and my problem is that we're spiritually dead. We're disconnected. 
What is physical death? My spirit is got separated from my body. What's spiritual death? When my life is separated from God because I'm living by my own ideas, my own values, my own decisions, I'm choosing to live separate from God. So that's called spiritual death. So if that's my problem, how do, what, what's, what's the answer? No rule keeping can make, you know, it's like somebody dies, right? You, you come across somebody and obviously they, they were unhealthy. They were mm, rather obese, a box of donuts beside them. They had a heart attack and they're dead. Now, so what are you going to do? You eat the donuts. No, no, you, 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 call, you, you call 911. So now, so then you go to the library and you get, a, you, you, you get a book, Eating Healthy for a Healthy Heart. And you give it to that person. This is what you should do. How many know that's irrelevant? Why? Because he's dead. It's too late. Listen, that book cannot help the guy to get a healthy heart. What does he need? He needs like jumper cables. That's sometimes what happens in a church service is that God comes along to our situation where we're living independent and we're kind of like, you know, doing our own thing and we don't recognize that our problem is we're spiritually dead. So God brings you, orchestrates so through a friend. Somehow you show up in church and you get a shock <laughs> to your system and you're like, wow, there's so much more to this than I ever imagined. Yes, there is. Because Jesus came that you might have life and have it life in abundance. All right, so salvation it's not of yourself. Grace is not of yourself. And this faith is not of ourselves. Here's the amazing thing. You know that, that, that faith and grace is not of yourself. It's not something that we produce. That's why no, every, every religion is, is rooted in man's ability somehow trying to reach God or appease God. And so that's, the, and that's, the, that's religion. But I, I love this because this is the gospel, and the gospel is understood in one word, done. It's not do, it's done. Christ did it for you. You're saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Because if it was about works, we'd be about God. Look at me, I did it without you. Look how holy I am. Look how good I am. But it's not of works. Listen, you, you're like that person that's dead. You know, you cannot make yourself come alive again. You need a miracle. And my friend, grace is a miracle miracle because God visits us in our spiritual alienation, in our darkness, in our confusion, and shines the light, and we become new creations all through a miracle, through grace and faith in Christ. Come on, somebody, if you believe that today. Saved by grace. There's no, there's no other way. There's no, other, no religion I can't save you. No church can save you. No religion can save you. Come on up here, Sam. We're ready to close. You getting anything out of this this morning? Here's the, here's the good news. This I want to close. The purpose of Christmas is reconciliation. You know, if, that, if all we had was the Christmas story, I mean, it's just it's so rich in the scriptures, and the angels begin to proclaim glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Our earth needs peace, doesn't it? And goodwill towards men. What a great revelation. God wants you to have peace, and God's will towards you is good. What kind of, what kind of peace does God want you to have? What kind of peace does Jesus bring? Oh, I, I love this, you know, the first of all, it's, it's peace with God. You know, this peace is also, there's three types of peace. One is peace with God. Look what it says in Romans. Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight by faith. Oh, I like that. When you decide, you say, you know what? I can't save myself. I, my good works are not good enough. Jesus, I'm trusting you. I'm inviting you. Because I tell you what, when I'm connected with God, and I got that sense of confidence, that peace. It doesn't matter what's going on in the world around me, because I got peace with God. If I got peace with God, I can take on anything. And here the scripture tells us, Therefore, since we've been made right in God's sight, you know that you're, by putting faith in Christ and recognizing God, I'm not living like this anymore. I'm not living in my own strength, my own ability. I'm going to trust in what Jesus did for me. I'm going to call Christ as my Savior. Then God, in His sight, that you are pure, forgiven, perfect. You're not trusting you. You're trusting Him. How amazing is that? And it says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, not by religion or works or trying harder, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ 
our Lord has done for us. That's the first thing. That's spiritual peace. Are you at peace with God? Do you have peace with God today? You can have it before you leave. That's why, that's why we're here today. The second thing is the peace of God. And this is mental. I like this. This is so healthy for us. Look at this verse. Paul writes this and he says, don't worry about anything. Man, I'm telling you when, you, when you start worrying, the Bible says that worrying is a sin because worry is saying, God, you don't know what you're doing, you know, or maybe you're a micromanager and you're like, God, you know what, I'm going to have to take care of this myself. You know, when you're worrying, it's like, you know, you should be worshiping rather than worrying because worry never solved a single problem. But so here Paul says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. How do I pray? Just start talking to God. What is it that you're worrying about right now? Well, you know, when uncle so-and-so comes, we always have family drama, or I don't know what's going to happen with my kids, or I don't know what's going with my parents, what's happening with my relationship, what's happening with my job. I don't know what's happening if I'm going to have a place to live next year. And you are gonna, We have all of these things, and all of these things, can, this pressure can be on you. But notice this says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Can you talk to God about it? Just talk to God. Bring it up to Him. And it says here, tell God what you need and thank Him. Let me tell you, that and thank Him is powerful. You know, the Bible says that God doesn't hold anything back. If He's given us Jesus, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Instead of whining and complaining and griping, why not offer up your prayers to God with thanksgiving? I stopped asking God for things quite some time ago. Because I realize in the Scriptures, I'm not, listen, I'm not going to ask God to give me something He's already told me in the Scriptures He's given me. Instead, I'm just going to live a life of gratitude. I'm just going to start thanking God for what He's already done for me. God, I thank You that You're already in my 2024. God, I thank You that You're already in my future. And you know, God, I thank you that I don't know what the bill's going to be. I don't, listen, when, when I get the electricity bill for this place, you know, it, it's like 10 grand, all right? You know, I, I, I just kind of like, God, praise God. I look at that. Thank you, God. You meet all, you've been so good to us that we don't have to fall under and we're not falling apart. God, so thankful. But when you mix your thanksgiving with your prayer, you know, and you thank him for all he's done, if you do this, here's a promise. If you do this, you will, exp you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. First one was peace with God. This is one that will help you with your mental health, the peace of God. First of all, it's not human peace. It's not normal. It's, it's, not, it's, it's superhuman. It's a supernatural peace. It's God's peace. You can have the peace of God. Even, listen, I'm not saying that all your circumstances are going to get straightened out, that all your circumstances are going to be perfect. No, most likely they're going to be just as crappy as they are today. The only difference is because you make God your strength and you talk to God and you thank Him for everything, you bring it to Him with thanksgiving, then you will experience God's peace, His peace. And what's it going to do? It's going to guard your heart and it's going to guard your mind. How many think that's pretty helpful? You know, that's a truth right there. We can all do that. And then the last one is relational peace, peace with one another. Listen, not, none of us can give what we don't have. You know, if you're not happy with your own life, you're not happy with where you're at, if you're not overflowing and walking in the love and that confidence, being centered, being grounded in Christ, you can't give what you don't have. You know, the greatest thing you can do for your family this, this holiday, just be a peace. Have, have the peace of God ruling and reigning in your heart and your mind. You know, be that source of strength for others because you're walking with God. I don't know what my future holds, but I know who holds my future. And the one thing I know this, He will never leave me nor forsake me, and I can bank my life on it, right? You know what? I, I know this. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going gonna, I, I, I'm gonna to be very human, but I'm so glad that I got a Savior who keeps me from falling. His name is Jesus, and He loves me, and He doesn't love me based on my, my it's not a conditional love, but it's an unconditional love. And we're going to close with this verse here. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Which is uh, wrong verse, sorry. It's this one. <laughs> that was a good verse too. It makes no difference who you are or where you're from. If you want God and are ready to do as He says, the door is open. 
Matter of fact, God's door has always been open. He's never closed it. The scripture reveals that the closed door is on our side. Revelations chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears and opens, you know, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. So who's doing the knocking? It's Jesus. God's door is open. He's already decided to love you, to bless you, to forgive you, give you a life of purpose, significance, and meaning. He wants to enrich and bless your life, but he can't do it if you are a closed up shop. If you're saying, God, no, I'm doing things my own way. That's what we talked about. Listen, why don't you open up the door to your heart today and say, God, I am not God. You are. I'm putting my trust in you. God, I want a fresh start, fresh beginning. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want your peace. I want to walk with you every day of my life. I want, I want to discover the purpose for my life and just live it out together with you.